So if, I, if my talk goes well this morning, then uh, at the end you'll say, that's it. And uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to take this information back and do zero downtime deploys uh, where you work, uh, which will be great. Uh, and hopefully it's uh, as illustrated uh, in the talk. It's really simple and straightforward to put together. Uh, so I'm Zarnecki D on Twitter and GitHub if you'd like to uh, comment on the talk afterwards uh, or any feedback, uh, and we'll have some of the, the code up there later. Uh, I'm also uh, not necessarily a professionally uh, accredited uh, musician like, like Mark was. I have a also interesting uh, story uh, of a famous person giving me some music memorabilia. So the company I work for is Agora Games, and we do uh, middleware online services for, for video games. So pretty uh, lucky in that uh, I get to work with Ruby and Python and video games uh, day in and day out. Uh, one of the franchises that we've worked uh, with is Guitar Hero, so I've worked with every one of the Guitar Hero uh, series. And uh, Guitar Hero Van Halen uh, was, uh, was a game that came out in 2009, and uh, great game, uh, but actually got uh, sent a Guitar Hero plate uh, from, signed by uh, every one of the members in Van Halen. Uh, which was pretty awesome. So all the original members of Van Halen, you know, there, there was that Sammy Hagar period, and you know, I, I'm sure we can fight about who was who was a better lead singer, but David Lee Roth uh, totally kicks ass there. Uh, so talk uh, today. Uh, we'll start out uh, as start of the introduction to uh, zero downtime. I uh, just wanted to introduce some things that are 24-7, things that operate uh, continuously. So diners, uh, there's Henry's Diner and uh, right here in Burlington, it's not 24-7, so they have downtime. It's bad, but there are many more diners uh, around the, the Northeast that, that, uh, that are 24-7. Video games are certainly 24-7. Uh, there is not a hour, minute, second in the day that people are not playing video games. And uh, uh, the first year that uh, I started at Agora in 2008, uh, Christmas uh, of that year, that was the year that uh, Guitar Hero World Tour uh, came out, so a lot of people were saving up to buy that uh, bundle since it was about $200, the full band kit and whatnot. And uh, I think our servers probably within uh, maybe an hour or so after kind of people had, uh, I guess, gotten the game, opened everything, and got, got set up. Maybe 12 to 15 million uh, requests coming into the back end of people playing the game, like all at once, and everything shut down. So we re-architected uh, that pain away, uh, and that's another talk, but video games 24-7. And so a lot of us doing Ruby and certainly coming from the Rails world, uh, web applications are 24-7. There's uh, not a time when people don't want to access your web apps, uh, whether it be in the States, I mean, we've got uh, four different time zones all over the world. People are going to access uh, your web applications every hour of the day, so any downtime, uh, in your application is a time when people aren't using or getting value out of uh, the service uh, that you're providing. So, uh, you know, as, as Rubyists, I think, you know, we've got a lot of uh, tools under our Ruby tool belt, and, you know, we've got all these gems, and we've got all these different servers, so is there, like, some magical unicorns and rainbows that we can just throw at this problem of, you know, how do we, how do we have our applications running continuously? Uh, it just so happens. Uh, so the question is, is there a 24-7 server? just so happens that we actually have unicorns in the, the Ruby world. Like actual unicorns, well. In the, in the code sense of, of things. but uh, So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what Unicorn is, and then we'll go into some, some more details there. Uh, so Unicorn is a fast uh, rack HTTP server, which is uh, really nice. Uh, so 
uh, you may, add, you know, out of the box, you start a Rails app and you're using WebBrick and then you graduate maybe to Thin or Fusion Passenger. Uh, Unicorn is uh, just another uh, server that you can use uh, to run your applications. Uh, and uh, again, really fast, uh, standards compliant, which is great. Uh, it also does process management for you, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, in that it can manage its workers and scale up and, and down the, the workers that, that it's using behind the scenes, uh, which is really nice, um, and responds to different signals to kind of make all of the zero downtime magic happen. It's also a thread safe server, so it runs uh, your workers in uh, isolated, like. Uh, sandboxes and memory and thread safe you know if you're coming from the enterprise world uh, and you've got your pointy haired boss going but uh, is, is can we can we rely on unicorn you can say ah it's thread safe and they'll go oh okay all right we just had to check check that box on the list of things to query the the devs about uh, it's also a zero downtime server and so that's what a large part of this will be uh, focused on kind of the particulars of wiring all the little bits together to get zero downtime in your apps. Uh, you may have read a, if you've been investigating kind of zero downtime and, and unicorn, uh, you may have read a blog post from, from GitHub. Uh, so that's the link to it up there about, they talk about their, a little bit about their architecture and uh, unicorn and, and doing uh, zero downtime and how Unicorn supports that, uh, which is great. And I'm sure like most of us, uh, GitHub comes out with a blog post or the GitHub way of doing things and, and we go, yes, we must follow the GitHub way now. So uh, it actually has practical benefits other than just being something that GitHub does. Uh, it's a really, <laughs> really great way to uh, achieve uh, zero downtime. So. Like why try, why try zero downtime in the first place? So you may be running uh, your locally sourced uh, shade grown Amazon EC2 instances, uh, which may not have a lot of uh, computing power. So when you get your app started, maybe your Rails app takes uh, 30 seconds to boot or however long it is. And if you are restarting the app and you may have uh, kind of that 30 seconds of downtime in between your app restarting, uh, it really limits you as far as how much downtime you can have if you're trying to achieve a certain level of uh, uptime service within a year. So if you want five nines uh, within a year, you have five minutes of downtime to play with uh, in, in a given year. Uh, so if your app takes uh, 30 seconds to boot and you don't have any continuity in the app, then uh, you're going to blow that within a day. Uh, if you're using Capstrano to do deployments, uh, you may know the Cap Web Enable and Disable tasks, and they work with, uh, I think, Apache and Nginx and maybe some other servers. You have to write some rules, and maybe there's a regular expression in there, and who knows how that works? Uh, same with magnets, right? I mean, it's a mystery. <laughs> There's like crazy science going on uh, there. So that's that's uh, I I can't deal with that. Uh, we'll see a little bit about uh, how Unicorn allows you to kind of scale up and down the workers instantly with uh, and adding more capacity to your apps without necessarily having to restart your app to. Uh, to add more juice to it. Uh, if you want to do continuous deployment, so we have uh, on a number of our apps, we have whenever you check something into uh, Git, uh, it goes through the process of uh, running all the tests, all your tests pass, uh, we do a deploy. So features, fixes, all of that happens. We probably do that maybe seven, ten times during the day. Uh, and without any downtime at all. And uh, I think I've got a slide later on just on a few of the statistics. But again, your web applications are 24-7, so there's no reason that the servers that are powering your web applications uh, should be any different. 
So our zero downtime story, and I forgot to put in the number of commits. So January, I looked through the commit log of uh, our kind of dashboard app that we have for a new product, and January 30th was the commit of game set match. Uh, finally got zero downtime deploys uh, working. So I was in beginning of this year, I was in Whistler for six weeks, uh, working remotely and snowboarding during the day. And uh, I'd come back uh, from snowboarding uh, in the afternoon just before everybody was kind of checking out on the East Coast. And invariably it's like, oh, we've got to restart Unicorn because the style sheets are, are borked. And so I was figuring that out and that's actually in the slides later on. Uh, so we've done umpteen number of commits since uh, January 30th of this year. Uh, we've had a number of uh, Ruby patch level updates in 1.9.3 and then making the switch to Ruby 2.0 and all of that downtime since uh, January 30th. So uh, just about uh, six or seven months now of having continuous operation for uh, an important uh, part of our uh, product. Really the genesis of this presentation is uh, in this gist here. So when I had figured out all of the moving parts and had to connect them together to make uh, zero downtime work, I said, you know, it's like Mark had said, if you don't, uh, if you think that everybody knows about it, not everybody uh, knows about all the things. And certainly it was just putting together all of the uh, particular particulars of things that had to be in the configuration files and, and whatnot, and all the little lessons learned of actually making it work uh, seamlessly. So uh, my SEO is strong, and uh, so the title of it is uh, Zero Downtime Deploys with Unicorn and Nginx and Run It and RVM and Chef. And if you could throw in more uh, Ruby tooling buzzwords, then I certainly would, uh, and I did. So Capistrano is in there as well, uh, since we use Capistrano for deployments. So actually, let's get into the particulars of making that happen. And uh, so I'll just go through the configuration files and kind of point out the salient bits uh, there of how to make it all work together. So our unicorn configuration file Pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, this is kind of stock unicorn stuff. So in our production environment, we're, we're spinning up six workers to uh, power the app uh, versus, say, one in our development environment. So nothing too groundbreaking there. We're, we're telling unicorn we want to preload the app, so we want the app to be available when it starts up. OK, that's great. Uh, Got a timeout in there. The, uh, this was an interesting uh, little gotcha where originally we were writing, where Unicorn was writing its PID file of, you know, here's, here's my running process, was in the, uh, where Capstrano kind of symlinks the current directory. And uh, so when the process would restart, it, uh, since the directories had changed and, and moved around, uh, it wouldn't be able to reclaim the old PID file and, and reclaim the, the old unicorn process, which is troublesome uh, because you get to uh, the next deploy and it goes, I'm already running and things kind of blow up from there. Uh, so it's really just making sure that the PID file is being written outside of the, the, the Rails directory itself. Then this was the the game set match uh, commit, uh, where I finally figured out, all right, in, in our infrastructure, what we do is after every deploy happens, we do a deploy clean. So it takes uh, all the old releases, it only keeps seven releases around, and we throw away all the, the old releases. And uh, so we get to, you know, again, at the end of the day, we'd have seven deploys done in that eighth one. Uh, would kind of rejigger things where uh, at a certain point the the location of where your where your your gem stuff exists goes away and your app goes I have no idea where any of the where any of the app stuff is so I'm not going to start and that's when somebody would have to go onto the server and actually kill the 
unicorn process and you'd be good again. So it was just figuring out there's a little uh, kind of before block that you can say, I want my, I need to set where my uh, gem file is for, for the app. Let's see, what else do we have? So the, there's another part of the, the unicorn configuration uh, where you tell it where to write its, uh, its old PID file when we're sending the signal to unicorn to say, hey, restart and uh, uh, you know, write out your old PID file to this location, then that's where, that's where it gets uh, written to. And uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Not really relevant, but if you have anything that needs to happen with like uh, just kind of cleaning up connections, uh, you can also do that in the unicorn configuration file. Uh, we use Capistrano for deployment, as uh, many other folks may. Uh, so we just had to uh, make sure that uh, when we were doing our deploys, uh, that we were, instead of sending a restart signal to the unicorn process to say, I really want you to like restart everything from scratch versus start a new uh, server in the background and then make the switch over happen. Uh, so we do that by sending uh, a USR2 signal to the Unicorn process. And what that does is it tells Unicorn, hey, I want you to restart uh, a new server process. And then as workers uh, finish processing requests from the old server, they'll transition to the new server. And that's where you get the zero downtime. Uh, so just had to modify our deploy script to send that instead of the, the restart signal and uh, also doing the asset pre-compilation before kind of things get linked uh, so that we don't have any weird issues with, with style sheets. Uh, the way our infrastructure is set up, so we have Nginx running uh, on, on our web servers, uh, and so we've got a couple of those. Nginx sits in front of Unicorn that, that we proxy to. And uh, so we use Unix sockets uh, in Nginx and Unicorn for, for talking from Nginx to Unicorn. So a bit faster than uh, talking straight HTTP, uh, which is really nice. And so that was just setting those bits up in the Nginx configuration of telling, you know, here, here's where uh, the Unicorn socket is gonna listen on. And uh, we used uh, Runit to manage our processes. And uh, so I was lucky enough to find this uh, there's an interesting XKCD comic where some guy, uh, I guess the gist of the comic is somebody kind of Googling for an answer in a forum, and it's like, forum 123 user, what did you see? And so I was lucky enough to actually get a hit on uh, managing, uh, managing uh, run it processes uh, with kind of our particular set up here. And uh, so most of the credit here is uh, <laughs> Uh, is for that author. The basic gist here is that uh, in our Runit script, Runit really likes to manage the processes itself. So what we do is in the Unix script, and uh, my Unix foo went up a little bit uh, with uh, just kind of reading through this and learning, uh, was uh, figuring out how to trap the signals uh, that the process is going to get and then passing them on to the, the Unicorn server in the background uh, or directly. So that was great. Uh, and so we just uh, tell it where the current PID file and the old PID file exist. Uh, the one little bit here as far as Unicorn uh, actually writing its PID file out was to daemonize the process. So again, these, these little things that uh, you read in a blog post of, oh, I'm using Unicorn and it writes and it can do these zero downtime switchovers, but actually making that all happen. It's like this little flag, the, the dash D can daemonize that and, and write it out and do the PID file wrangling. It's not captured in any one place. Uh, so just had to uh, figure that out. And again, instead of uh, uh, sending a restart signal to say, hey, I want you to really kill yourself uh, uh, and restart the server, where you would have downtime is to send this USR2 signal and do all the process wrangling in the, in the background. And here's the little bits about uh, actually trapping the signals and then sending some other uh, signals to the unicorn process in the background. So 
Just really quickly kind of recapping the, the salient points of all the, the configuration bits there. So as far as Unicorn, and so this is kind of the, the gist of the gist, I guess you could say. So it's like a meta gist IRL. Uh, so uh, with Unicorn, if that's even a thing, I just made that up. Uh, so with Unicorn, it was uh, making sure that our PID file was written outside the Rails route. Like, totally makes sense now, but at the time was just one of those things that, oh, okay, duh, yeah, it, you know, I should, I should not do that. Uh, and I'm bad for having done it in the first place. Uh, so using uh, that before exec block to tell Unicorn uh, or actually the environment where my gem file is actually located so that when we do the deploy cleanup that it's actually pointing to the right place, uh, the current, uh, the current uh, location for the app. For Capistrano, it was instead of sending a restart to our app uh, process, we're sending a USR2 signal. So that was, that was pretty straightforward. As with the Nginx bits where we're listening on a Unix socket instead of uh, another transport there. Run it, uh, which was again just that, that, that D flag to daemonize, make sure that we're daemonizing the, the unicorn process which will actually write out the PID file and again we can send the, the, the signal to the, the process via that PID and get the zero downtime deploys. But there are actually other uh, cool things besides doing the zero downtime uh, with Unicorn, which, is, which are pretty neat. So I'll talk about a few of those. Uh, if you send your Unicorn process uh, TTIN signal, it will increment the number of workers that are available for handling requests in your application. And you do that without downtime. So it just starts up another worker automatically. You don't have to restart servers at all. So it's like insta-scale in your application. And uh, so that's actually really handy. Uh, we've used that uh, in a number of uh, uh, instances where we just needed to add capacity and uh, needed it for a short burst. Uh, and then you can actually, the opposite of that is sending a TTLU signal to the process and that will dial back uh, the number of workers. So really nice uh, that, that you can actually do that uh, without having to do the restarts. Uh, there's a gem called Rack Stats D, and uh, so uh, learned or kind of refamiliarized myself with a little more of things that you can do with Ruby to uh, have some kind of nice output. So I had forgotten that we were actually using this gem in our app, and I would go onto the servers and I'd look, and hopefully that's that's legible, and and I'd look at uh, this output. And you can see we've got six workers. It's telling me the name of the process. It gives me the SHA of the commit. And it gives me the number of requests each worker served. And on average, like how long requests are taking and utilization. So really interesting information. I thought, oh my gosh, unicorn is like, there are unicorns within unicorns because this is this information is so great from an ops perspective, just to know kind of utilization and, and things like that. But it was actually the Rack Stats D gem where it uh, overwrites the I believe it's dollar sign zero the process information and it put outputs all of those interesting bits there. You can do more if you wanted to, but you know it's nice to be able to go on to a server and say, yep the SHA of you know, the code that we're running uh, in whatever environment, say in production, is exactly the, the latest. And you know, here's how things are being spread across the workers. You can see if there are bottlenecks in, in your app and whatnot. Just really, really nice. Uh, so we'll talk uh, a little bit about migrations. And so this is kind of the elephant in the room. Like, how do you do you know, you've done zero downtime for kind of a lot of uh, maybe just uh, small updates to your app. You might be changing text, but how do you do harder things like actually adding stuff like migrations or indexes? Uh, so we're all using NoSQL, right? I mean, 
we don't have we don't have to worry about migrations. It's just you know we we have a, a new table or a new columns and they they're just magically added, right? No, no. <laughs> Nobody's even. Uh, so uh, I guess there there are a few different approaches that that I was thinking of. So you can have actual downtime where. You know, I know GitHub does this uh, a few times, and, and other folks uh, do it. Where, you know, maybe you have uh, too much data, or you want a, uh, for whatever reason, you actually need to take down servers because you're swapping physical hardware, or whatever, whatever it might be. So just have some idea based on your your data. Uh, you know, try and assess like how long things are are going to take, so you can develop. You know, we're we're going to be down for five minutes or ten minutes or, or however long it is. Do your schema changes. Probably the most important thing is to actually communicate, you know, where uh, where you're at in in the process when when you're doing actual downtime. Obviously, having a rollback plan as far as you know, if all hell breaks loose and it can and will break loose. Uh, then just having some way of kind of getting back to whatever. Uh, uh, whatever you had previously uh, certainly makes sense. Uh, can you do zero downtime uh, uh, without having to have actual downtime? So it, in some instances, it actually depends on the back end that you're using. So uh, something I just learned uh, this week, uh, there was a blog post from the folks at ThoughtBot so Postgres, Postgres uh, actually supports concurrent indexing, where it'll do the indexing in the background. You have to do it outside of a transaction that Rails migrations actually run in, uh, but Rails 4 uh, migrations now support that. So depending on your back end, you may be able to get away with uh, adding indexes or doing uh, data migrations without necessarily having downtime. but why MMV? It's it's uh, there are probably too many cases to to enumerate there. Uh, so one thing we actually do is uh, we have this notion of a shadow production environment. So uh, I guess the analogy that I bring up is the Death Star. Like if you're going to build one, why not two? Uh, and you know have have two. Uh, environments that you can that that maybe the the shadow is kind of slaving off of uh, your your main production environment. You can do the changes there. Uh, maybe see how long it's going to take, and then uh, you know make all your changes. It might still be getting live data, uh, but uh, at that point when uh, you've actually uh, made the changes after you've done your deploy, you kind of swap out that shadow environment and then your other environment becomes the, the shadow. And uh, so it's really working out well in that regard. We don't have many cases where, or we haven't had cases yet where we've, where we've needed to, you know, I don't know how we're going to do this without downtime for any environment. So it's just one of those uh, uh, learning, learning things. And uh, so hopefully you have learned a little bit about how to do uh, zero downtime uh, this morning, but uh, I'm here all weekend. If you have particular questions about the particular particulars in this talk, uh, otherwise, thank you very much.